Hello everyone, welcome to the TriStar Gym channel. Today's episode is an episode on fitness and nutrition. Um, thank you all for sending me all your questions. We got hundreds and hundreds of questions. I looked at, looked over a few uh, before starting this episode. You guys sent me some great stuff. We're going to have a great, great episode. I'm sure your most liked questions are going to be answered in this episode. Before we get started, I first want to say a, a quick thank you to Quest Nutrition for supporting this channel, making this channel possible, and of course now uh, Reebok who's sponsoring the TriStar Gym and this channel. Thank you very much for participating and allowing us to have this forum and share content with each other. I really appreciate also everybody who sent me in uh, these great questions. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. The first question we have here is from Mustafa Al. How to build a strong lower back? <clears throat> so Mustafa, you're asking me how to build a strong lower back. Well, first off, the definition of strong might be very different from one person to the next. What is strength? You know, strength is a, it ha it's a very wide definition. Now, most people when they ask me these kind of questions, how do you build a strong lower back? They're talking about how do I build a strong lower back, meaning how do I squat heavy? How do I get a strong deadlift? You know, how do I have my lower back be really, really powerful that I can lift vast amounts of weights? Now, if that's what your definition of strength is, I would try to divert you from that goal. And I, I don't think you should go down that path, okay? Because if you're a martial artist, if you're doing kickboxing, jujitsu, Muay Thai, uh, whatever sport you're doing, you don't really need what, what you would call, what most people would call a strong lower back. Now, again, the definition of strong lower back, you didn't give it to me, so I'm going to have to give you, I'm going to have to uh, um, give you your own definition here. What most people say when they mean strong lower back, oftentimes when I get approached, is they want to do the compound lifts. They want to squat big, they want to deadlift big. They want to Olympic lift big. They want to clean and jerk big. They want to snatch big. Okay, so they want to lift a lot of weight with the barbell. Now, I'm a big believer in barbell, but I don't believe in lifting big weights. I believe in 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 what Louis Simmons calls dynamic effort. Okay, so you you take a sub maximal weight, maybe about seventy percent of what what your max would be, and you just move it fast. Okay, so you would squat fast. You would deadlift. Maybe not with deadlift. Deadlift you, it's it's a tricky move. You don't want to do deadlifts fast, but clean and jerk, snatch, et cetera, or the hybrid uh, pulls. These, these are what I would want to do. But <clears throat> even before that, if I was were to, to, to put uh, training in a hierarchy, I would definitely put gymnastics as the highest level, okay? Now, gymnastics, you, know, you might not think that's strength. It is absolutely strength, okay? So, uh, gymnastic training is more functional, in my opinion. Uh, it translates better on the mats, in the ring, than lifting weights. Okay, now I believe in lifting weights to a certain degree. I think it, it um, has a lot of benefits, and I'm sure we'll get into it in this episode. There are very good benefits into lifting weights. I lift weights quite a bit here and there. Okay, I go through cycles and patches of, of weightlifting, but I also do a lot of body weight. Now, body weight will build your stability. It will build your coordination, which is huge, because Olympic lifters, <clears throat> um, squatting, deadlifting, yes, it, there's a lot of technique to it, but you just... You just really learn to move in one way, okay? A deadlift will help you with your double leg. It'll help you with your sprawl, but it won't help you with anything else. You know, it won't help you with much else. It won't necessarily make you hit harder. That's a myth, okay? There, there's no there's no research whatsoever that lifting big weights translates to punching harder or running faster, etc. There's not, there's not a lot of correlation there, okay? Now, <clears throat> when we're talking about lifting weights, and I know we're going to talk a lot about lifting weights in this episode, I believe there's a place for lifting weights. I do lift weights. I think it's very good. And we'll talk about the benefits later on. It builds bone density. It helps you put on muscle, etc. cetera. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful art. But before you get into weightlifting, if you were talking about building a strong, stable lower back, you want to use gymnastics. Now, the best resource I can point you to, a really simple resource, is gymnasticswad.com. So gymnasticswod.com. You go there. Um, an excellent, excellent um uh, gymnastics coach there he's giving the material away for free he teaches you how to do the gymnastics maneuvers you can just do them at home really simple stuff I do a little bit of it after practice I do it once in a while I do a little gymnastics to keep my body in shape and sometimes I lift weights sometimes I do kettlebell I use all the tools under the sun but if there was one tool if I only had to use one tool it would definitely be gymnastics it would definitely be my body weight so because because of the stability the, the incredible amount of stability it gives you and I also like the exercise ball, you know, those those uh, BOSU balls or whatever you call them, the gymnastic balls. I think those are awesome because they, they build so much stability and uh, they're very, very gentle on the body. They don't overuse the joints. And the thing about strong lower backs, 
you guys should familiarize yourself with the work of Stuart McGill. Now, Stuart McGill is the number one lower back expert in the world. Yeah, he's the number one lower back expert in the world. And he's, he's and I've got to work with him directly, which is a real bonus for me. So I can give you guys um, <clears throat> his philosophy in a nutshell real quick. And I've also read his material. His material, he's written about 12 books. Uh, I've read one of his books. Phenomenal, phenomenal uh, uh, book. He's the number one authority on lower backs. And, and it's interesting that you asked how to build a strong lower back. Now, According to Stuart McGill, a lower back is not necessarily, it doesn't need to be strong. It needs to be very stable. We're talking about the lumbar spine. The lower back needs to be very stable. Now, stability is a type of strength. So we could say that it needs to be strong. But what kind of strength? The lower back doesn't have to be able to, to lift a crazy amount of weight. That's not what a strong lower back does. Now, according to Stuart McGill, why he says that? Because according to his research, and this might shock a, few, uh, a bunch of you, and a lot of you might disagree with him, but again, this is Stuart McGill's research. Please take it up with him. He says that people with above average strength in the lower back, big lifters, those with really strong lower backs, are prone to back pain. And also, people with very flexible lower backs, so all those yogis, and ha are prone to back pain. So having a hyper-flexible back and having a very strong lower back, meaning you can lift a lot of you know you're, you could pull heavy on the deadlift you could squat really really heavy the people who, who build their lower backs and that type of strength the compound lifts are prone to pain lower back pain so Stuart mcgill says you shouldn't stretch your lower back very deeply and you shouldn't try to build a huge squat you shouldn't try to build a huge deadlift i think you should build an adequate deadlift you should build an adequate squat now I'm a believer in, in doing a little squatting, doing a little deadlift, but I don't take it so far that I can squat 500 pounds. I'm nowhere near that. I could squat roughly about my body weight, and I think that's as much as you need. If you're a martial artist, you don't need to go further than this. If you go further than this, it'll start to hamper in your skills. Your jiu-jitsu will start to suffer. Your boxing will start to suffer. Now, <clears throat> I got to also work with a sports science lab, okay, it's, um, if you guys know Marv Marinovich, he's a, he was one of the best NFL uh, trainers at one point, a very highly tutored uh, uh, trainer. I think he trained his son, who was also a, a first draft in the NFL, the Robo QB, really, really big uh, uh, hopeful in, in the NFL, etc. And uh, I got to work with one of his students named uh, um, Gavin McMillan, who, who rehabbed George, etc. And you guys might have heard of Speed of Sport, the, the ones who were the... The, the team that's training um, uh, Rafael dos Anjos and uh, and uh, the, the the speed of sports is uh, they, they come from Marv Marinovich, Marv, Marinovich, Marv Marinovich's system they come from uh, the SSL system so it's all the same system and I got to work with them directly okay now now Marv Marinovich when he was coaching in the NFL he was looking at all the the lifting he was he was a fitness trainer right he, he was coaching in the NFL and he was looking at all the lifters. And he was realized that, hey, all the guys with the biggest lifts, all the guys with the biggest squat, the biggest bench press, the biggest clean and jerk, they were all the second and, and third string. And then he made this connection. He's like, hey, how come the A-listers, how come the, the first string guys have the weakest lifts? And then we're hammering these guys to get these bigger lifts, get these bigger lifts, get these bigger lifts. But the guys who actually do what we asked them to do, the guys, who, this is what he was saying. And I, and I spoke to him over the phone, actually. I actually got to interview with, with Marv Rinovich. He, he was kind enough to answer a lot of my questions. He says the guys with the bigger lifts were the were not the best players. So why are we driving these men to do this team to get bigger lifts? So he made this connection. He threw all the weight training out the window. Now I didn't throw all the weight training out the window. I I still have a home for it to a certain degree. And I'll talk to you guys maybe in this episode a little bit more about it why. But according to Speed of Sport, according to Marvin Marinovich, according to SSL Sports Science Lab, throw the weights out. It's useless. Okay now. You guys might might have heard Troy Polamalu. Polamalu, sorry if I'm butchering his name. I forget how. how I'm not a huge football fan, I, I, but I, I know that he does do the SSL program. He doesn't lift weights, and <clears throat> the reason for it is it doesn't translate to the field. Okay, now I believe in what SSL does. Marvin Rinovich does. I think it's great. It's just also so similar to gymnastics. It's just so similar to the gymnastics. Gymnastics is about speed. It's about explosion. It's about being able to grind. Gym, gymnasts can do it all. They can grind. They can explode. They're flexible. They're mobile, etc. They have it all. So check out Gymnastic Wad. Don't try to be a big heavy lifter. If you're a jiu-jitsu guy, MMA guy, 
if you're a striker, if you're a boxer, whatever, don't become a heavy lifter. It'll just kill your your skill. Okay, if you do a lot of heavy lifting, it drains your CNS, your central nervous system. For you to learn skill after, it becomes very very difficult. Okay, there's a reason why jocks, <laughs> you know, their their stereotype is that they're dumb, right? When you lift a lot of weights, it drains your battery. So when you go to school the next day, you can't concentrate on what they're teaching you. You know, if your if your CNS is overloaded, you can't learn. So Expect your, your jiu-jitsu to be really sloppy. Except, expect for you not to be able to retain techniques if you do a lot of heavy lifting. Ex except, expect for your trainer to have to teach you something 50 times before you, you capture it. If, that, if that's you, maybe it's the weights that are burning out your nervous system. Okay, now I don't know if you guys have heard, but there's plenty of research where they take somebody and, and give him an IQ test, then they make him run on a treadmill, they fatigue him, and then they give him the same level of IQ test and his score drops. Why? His nervous system is fatigued. So think about it. When you're trying to learn something and your brain is just tired, <clears throat> you can't learn. You, your brain just can't absorb it. So when you ever have that foggy feeling, your nervous system needs rest. Do not burn your nervous system with, with heavy weights. Do not injure your lower back with heavy, heavy weights. Keep the weight <clears throat> moderately heavy. Never go more, never, never lift a weight that you can't lift five times. If you can't lift it, if you're an experienced lifter, a, a triple, lifting away three times and having two or three reps in reserve is wise. But never go to your max. Never lift your max. If you're a martial artist or a boxer, you should never lift your max. The only people who should ever lift their max are people who, whose sport is weightlifting. All right, guys. So I know I spent a lot of time on this first question, but there's just so much to know about the lower back. And maybe in future episodes, we'll talk about it again. Okay, next one here. Um, <clears throat> Jim Vader. Can you give us your view on ketogenic diet? Jim Vader, the ketogenic diet. Well, for those of you who don't know, the ketogenic diet, real simple, is when your body has fats and sugars or fats and carbs, the first thing it does is it burns the carbs. Once it's burned all your carbohydrates, so your breads, your pastas, your, your, your juices, your sugar, it starts to burn ketones for energy. Okay, So the first thing your body burns, if you give your body, if you give your body ice cream, now, in the ice cream, there's sugar and there's fat. Your body's going to burn all that sugar and then get to the fat. So when you're burning fat, you're, it's burning ketones. So if you guys have ever been on a low-carb diet and then you get that, you, don't, you haven't eaten carbs in a while and then you get that bad breath, that's your body burning ketones. Now, you know you know your body's burning fat. Okay, So according to the, the, the ketone diet uh, believers, they say, that, hey, if you want to lose fat, you should always be running on fat. Don't don't give your body more. Some say 50 grams of carbs. Some say 75 grams of carbs. Some say 35 grams of carbs, depending on your, your, your fitness level. Now, they give you a little bit of carbs so you don't feel horrible. And then when those carbs start to get really low, the body starts to burn <clears throat> the fat. Now, this works. You'll lose weight if you do this. I personally don't like uh, the ketogenic diet. I think... I think it's a very dangerous diet. Now, I, I'll let you guys do your own research on this. I'll let you guys read. Uh, I'm going to recommend a couple of books for you guys. Anything written by by Michael Kogan is brilliant. He's a PhD in nutrition. Okay, this, guy, this guy's a PhD. He's written incredible books on nutrition. The guy's a doctor. He's a brilliant man. Um, lots of anti-aging stuff from him. Make sure to read uh, the, the new nutrition or... The new power program. He talks a lot. He talks a little bit about nutrition. We'll get, we'll get back to to uh, to different authors in, in a little bit. But when you when you burn fats for energy, you have to eat fats. So where are you going to get your fats from? You're going to get your fats from flesh foods, flesh foods. So you're going to get it from chicken. You're going to get it from turkey. You're going to get your fats from red meat. Now <clears throat> there are a lot of correlations between animal fats or flesh foods. And diseases, lots of correlations. You eat a lot of animal fats, you get diseases. Okay, so I'm not a I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a PhD in nutrition, but I'm going according to what Dr. Furman says. Joel Furman. I'm going to recommend you guys his book right now. His book is called The End of Dieting by Joel Furman. The End of Dieting. It is the best nutrition book I've ever read in my life. It is a top book. I follow his diet. His diet is high carb, low fat. It's the opposite of the ketogenic diet. Now. When we're talking about high carbs, we're talking about natural carbs, okay? Mainly greens, vegetables, fruits, plant foods. Plant foods are number one, according to Joel Furman. And his, his book is so enlightening. You must read this book. If, you, if you're going to read one book on nutrition, and there are thousands and thousands of books, countless books, read Joel Furman's 
the the new nutrition. Uh, excuse me, not the new nutrition. That's that's Michael Kogan. Read Joel Furman's The End of Dieting. You must read this book. If this is one book you're gonna read for your health, this is the book. Okay, there's an audio book as well. It's super easy to listen to. He reads it himself. It's a uh, it's great, great, great material to to study. Now, when you eat flesh foods, you're gonna feel, in my opinion, look. I, well, before I read read the end of dieting, I did a lot of flesh foods. You know, lower my carbs. I'd have carbs closer to training, and then I'll eat a lot of flesh foods. Now, when I eat a lot of flesh foods, I would train really hard, wake up the next day tired, but I was eating all these proteins. I thought, you know, my body's recovering. I train really hard, get home, have a small amount of carbs. You know, even the ketogenic diet, you're allowed some carbs, and then mostly flesh foods. And vegetables, greens. You're allowed a lot of greens. No, no fruits, no sugars. You know, no sugars from fruits. Very, very limited amount of carbohydrate. Um, I lost weight. I was lean, very lean, but I'd wake up tired. I'd wake up. My body was acidic. My body was tired. Now, when I switched to to uh, the end of dieting program, what Joel Furman, uh, Joel Furman calls uh, being a nutritionist, okay, he's uh, not a nutritionist, a nutritarian, excuse me, he invented the word nutritarian, so he, if you follow his diet, you're a nutritarian, um, his, his diet is all based on the highest, the most highly uh, nutritious foods, okay, he talks about the Andy score, now the Andy score is, the higher the nutrition in a, in a food, and the lower the calorie, the higher your Andy score for that food, okay, so for instance, leafy, leafy greens are high in nutrition and very low in calories, so their Andy score is really, really high, and he gives you uh, uh, all these foods with all their Andy scores and he tells you this is the stuff you got to eat okay so I started eating like that I used to come home and instead of having flesh foods I would have a lot of greens I would have a lot of fruit uh, I would have a lot of lentils beans etc everything that comes from plants okay you you you, you should take t your time and and check out uh, his food pyramid Joel Furman's food pyramid it's very simple take a look at it review it and you'll notice that the top of his pyramid so the top of the pyramid the least amount of substance you should eat is flesh foods. Okay, so he says red meat, cheese, um, you know, poultry, all that stuff. That's that you should have sparingly, once, twice a week. Okay, depending on how your system can handle it. So the ketogenic diet in the ketogenic diet, proteins, flesh foods are at the bottom of the pyramid, whereas in the, the end of dieting, it's at the top of the pyramid. So there's two philosophies here, two schools of thought, two opposite schools of thought. One says high carbs, low fat. And the other says high fat, low carbs. I've done them both. I recommend you experiment with both. Now, there's a lot of research that shows that ketogenic diets can be very unhealthy, very unhealthy for your heart. You're eating a lot of saturated fats. And again, saturated fats are cor correlated with a lot of diseases, even cancer. Now, I really recommend you 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 read the material from a doctor, a PhD like uh, Joel Furman, and he will he will explain to you as simple as as he gets. He's he's a very good, he's an excellent author because he makes things simple, and he explains to you. Look, you want to eat flesh foods, you're gonna get sick. At the end, of, you know maybe not now, not not in your youth, but as you grow older, you will get sick. So, um, you asked me to speak to this, uh, speak on this topic in in its entirety. I can't go into that as, as deep, but. Definitely, definitely, I'm the opposite. I believe in high carb, not processed carbs, of course, fruits and vegetables, lentils, uh, beans, etc. And 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 Stuart, uh, excuse me, um, Joel Furman says something really interesting. He he allows half raw and half cooked uh, vegetables, which is great because you can have soups, you can have salads, etc. Whereas some, uh, you know, uh, very extreme. Uh, um, uh, vegans or whatnot, they, they or I should say raw food is want the food always raw, and I've done that. Raw food is awesome, you know. Raw food is awesome. When I was on a raw diet, I felt so good, but I was just so bored with the diet. After a few months, it was just so boring. And you'd go to a restaurant, it's always salad, etc. It's always this, it's always that. You go to a friend's home, home, they invite you to dinner. You can't eat anything warm. It's just, it's just too inconvenient for our day and age. And Joel Furman, he allows for. He allows for uh, cooked vegetables, which I really enjoyed. And it just kicked me uh, to the next level. And I was able to stay on this vegetable diet, this 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 high-carb, low-fat diet, really easy. I love cooked vegetables. And uh, it just made it so much easier for me to be on that diet. So my my approach, high-carb, low-fat all the way, um, you'll, you'll notice the recovery. You'll notice the high energy, the incredible amount of energy. Your energy will change. I'll tell you one thing. Eat a big steak. Eat a you know nice cake. Have some broccoli. See how you feel after. You're tired. You're 
tired. Your body's got to go break down all that greasy fat. Have yourself a nice vegetable salad, soup, lentils, quinoa, plant foods. You're going to feel amazing. One hour, two hours, three hours later, the amount of fiber you're getting and carbs is the best combination for your body and very, very low fat. Vegetables and fruits, lentils, they're low in fat or they have the proper fats, the good fats, not saturated fats, okay? So I, I might have spent a little longer than I needed to on this question, but it is an awesome question. High carb, low fats all the way. Next one here from Tom Casey. I'm a lightweight, 155. I want to go up to 170, 180. How many reps and sets should I be doing? And how much should I do on each muscle like flat bench, butterfly, pectorals? See, this is the kind of stuff I get all the time. Bench press, squat, etc. Now look, if you want to get big, you have to increase your calories. But you have to increase your calories gradually. If you increase your calories, if you double, excuse me, if you double your calories, you're going to get fat. You don't want to get fat. You want muscle you want to put on lean lean muscle now i would recommend to you just be at your normal body weight be at your normal body weight what's wrong with being 155 there's nothing wrong with being 155 but after that if you still want to be 170 180 like you claim here i would recommend the best way to do it is the compound lifts now the compound lifts is dead uh, excuse me deadlift squat and their hybrids bench press etc just like you said now i wouldn't do these exercises i wouldn't go very heavy i would go maybe uh i would do f reps of five okay but i would do lots of sets you know as many as your body feels comfortable as many as your body feels comfortable because i don't know your fitness level so i might start with three sets work my way up to four five six then ten sets the more sets you do the more chance you're gonna have of, of muscle growing now uh, there's a lot more to it than that. I'll refer you to one of the best uh, uh, books I've read on, on uh, lifting. It's called Power to the People by Pavel Tsatsoulin. It's really, really good because he makes it really, really simple and easy to understand. And he says, if you want to have more muscle mass, just keep doing more sets. You know, And he talks to you about how to cycle your lifts, etc. Now, again, <clears throat> this kind of flies in the face of what I said earlier. Gymnastics for me is the best, but gymnastics won't add as much muscle in my experience, as the compound lifts. If you're going to do deadlifts and squats, specifically squat because the eccentric contraction is so long. When you're squatting down, your muscles are stretching. Okay, they're, they're expanding. They're, they're getting that elastic stretch reflex. That's called the eccentric phase of the muscle when the muscle is elongating. That is the king. Okay, according to uh, Mike Kogan here, he says eccentrics are king. Why? Because they add the most amount of strength and the most size. So squatting is huge. Nothing will make you bigger than squatting. If you are serious about muscle mass, they've done researches where they make they make people squat and do biceps versus a group who does biceps and triceps. So one group is doing biceps and triceps for two months, or, or sorry, it was like I think it was six weeks, and the other group was doing squats and biceps. Guess who's group who who got bigger arms? The group that was doing squats and biceps had more muscle mass gain, on average, than the group who did bicep and tricep. Why? One group is only working their arms. How come their arms didn't get bigger than the group who's working legs and arms? Because when you work your squats, you trigger a whole series of hormones and you use the you know the largest muscle group in your body, etc. So that triggers more growth. Uh, it's a whole domino effect, but it ends up triggering more growth. So squatting is king. Read Pavel Tatsulin's um, uh, Power to the People so you don't hurt yourself. There's a lot to know about lifting, mainly form and never going to your max, Okay. Next question here, 800 M Eric, what can, what can I do to alleviate getting very sore from working out and running and lifting weights? Um, should I do more warm-ups? You're asking me here, what's the best warm-up? What's the best cool down? Okay, well, this is huge. Okay, this is such an important question. And I was so happy it was so highly uh, liked. You know, you guys really like this question. You guys, it's one of the top questions. You should never be sore. No, don't fall over now. But I work out six days a week. I am never listen carefully i am never sore you should never be sore okay get that in your head put that in the brain here because people are always 180 degrees to what i'm saying people go in the gym they beat the hell out of their bodies and then they brag about how sore they are and thinking they're making great gains now this is a highly inefficient way to train i'm not even going to list all the bad things it's just it's just a horrible way to train Go to the gym, make yourself as sore as possible, beat your body up and suffer through the pain. And you think this is going to bring you to um, some kind of like 
super level of athleticism. Now, I'll tell you one thing. I work out six days a week, and I always do enough to give my body a push, but I'm really careful not to be sore. If I if I did something with, if I did any workout and I was sore the next day, I'd be angry with myself. Why did I let myself go that far? Because soreness is to be, fatigue and training is to be managed. It's not to be induced. If you have a trainer that yells at you and tells you screaming at the top of his lungs, one more rep, one more rep, one more rep, he's not necessarily an, an expert trainer. Okay, now this is my my biggest critique towards CrossFit. And I, and I think CrossFit has a lot of great elements to it. But one element that it's that is the Achilles heel of CrossFit is that it's fatigue-seeking. It seeks to induce fatigue. So in CrossFit, they tell you, hey, beat your time. You know, you did it last time, this amount, beat it this time. Go to your max and push yourself. Whenever you put, imagine you're driving your car to work every day and you pushed your car to the maximum. You were redlining, you were flooring it every day, you were racing your car to work every day. You were just killing it. At the end of the year, your mechanic's gonna be like, what the hell, what the hell did you do with this car? Which I, this was a brand new car a year ago, and now it's just it's a wreck. Same thing's gonna happen with your body. When you go to practice, when you go to the gym, your 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 goal is to exercise the body, give the body uh, workout 60 to 70 maximum 80 percent of your ability and then do that every day not go into the gym do 95 percent of your ability 99 percent of your ability redline the car you know then your shoulders sore then your neck is sore and then your back you have back problems listen i'm 36 years old i train every single day i have no pain anywhere and we're going to talk about keeping your body out of pain uh, I, i'm lucky i work with the best experts in the world we're going to have a special episode, special episodes on just how to keep you train every day and not be sore and not, not be in pain and keep your neck straight, keep your back straight, keep your shoulders healthy. We're going to talk about all this stuff. This is really important stuff, okay? Form, uh, keeping your body mobile, etc. Super, super important stuff. But the number one component, when you go to practice, never redline. Now, I did a really, really good, uh, uh, important video called, uh, um, what was it called, that video? I did a video called... Um, how to stay fit for life or something like that. Look it up, okay? Uh, maybe I'll put in the link. How to stay fit for life. Look at it in my videos. Go sort through. Listen to that video. I explain exactly what I'm talking about. When you go to the gym, you just work out. Don't push yourself to the maximum. It's better to work out every day at 70% than to work out twice a week at 99%. I guarantee you the guy who's working out every day at 70% will go way further than the guy who's working at 99% or 85%, 90%, because that guy who's always redlining is gonna be broken down in a few years. His knee's gonna be jammed, his neck's gonna be jammed, he's gonna throw a, uh, he's gonna throw a hook one day, his shoulder's gonna fall apart. I've seen it, and I've seen it time and time again. So, be moderate in your practice. Work out enough that you get a sweat, that you, that you induce recovery, slight amount, but not soreness and pain. If you're in sore and pain, in my opinion, you push it too far. If you cannot work out the next day, you overdid it. Okay, so keep that in mind. Very important stuff here. Next one here, Ruben Sanchez. Can you effecti effectively gain muscle on the ketogenic diet? So ketogenic diet, like we said, low carb, high fat. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Now, if you're on a, a low carb diet and you finish working out and you eat carbs right after working out, you, you're gonna gain more muscle mass than if you don't, okay? So after workouts or before workouts, if you wanna increase your muscle mass, ingest some carbohydrates. Okay, now the best carbs, in my opinion, is, is, is dates and honey, but you can have a shake. You put a little bit of juice in it, a little bit of your favorite juice, have a little bit of sugar immediately or a little bit of carbohydrates immediately after training, and that will help you uh, gain more muscle. So this is called, some people refer to it as carb timing. Add a little bit of carbs right after practice, right after lifting weights. Even though you're, you're on a low-carb diet, it will induce muscle, okay? It will uh, create more muscle. Next one here, O Demolisher, which will improve, which will improve more, my cardio more? Which will improve my cardio more? So, excuse me. Grappling or striking or sparring? Well, <clears throat> if you want to increase your cardio for grappling, you, there's specific types of cardio, right? In, in exercise science, we have a principle called specific adaptation to impose demand. It's called the SAID principle, S-A-I-D. Specific adaptation to impose demand demand so whatever you impose on your body that's what your body's going to give you back it's going to adapt to okay so if i want to increase my grappling cardio and i do more boxing it's not going to increase my grappling cardio okay so take a guy who's really seasoned in boxing 
and then grapple with him, he's going to be burned out. He's going to be tired. And then take a grappler, a really seasoned grappler, and make him do a couple of rounds of, of boxing. He's going to be really tired. Okay, so their cardios are both good, but they're built for something else. So your body's going to adapt specifically to what you make it do. So if you want more cardio for grappling, you would grapple more. If you want more cardio for boxing, you would box more. If you want more cardio for uh, sparring, I used to say sparring, I was very vague. Spar more. Specifically, whatever you want cardio for, that's what you should try and, and implement. Okay, that's one of the keys to uh, increasing cardio. Red Chief Al, what food do you give to your children and why? Well, um, you know, I let my kids eat almost anything. You know, I let them have whatever they want. I don't want to be strict with their diet. They're too young for that. Um, I let them, I, 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 I do make them smoothies. Though I'm very adamant about making them smoothies. I put a lot of greens. I put a lot of frozen berries, etc. I put a banana in there. I put a lot of good stuff, sometimes a date to sweeten it. A lot of plant foods, all plant foods. 99% of what goes in there is plant food. And it's so high in nutrition that... Uh, in, 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 in nutrients that uh, I'm very confident and also their, for their fiber, etc. I'm very confident that I'm giving them a, a healthy diet, but also my kids, they love junk food and uh, their grandparents, they're always with their grandparents and, you know, my parents have no no notion at all about nutrition. So I can't watch them 24 hours a day. My grandparents, their grandparents don't cooperate with me. So at the end of the day, they do get a lot of bad foods. But my way to counter that is to make sure they get a lot of uh, smoothies. I, I make sure to get a lot of high nutrient foods, and smoothies is an easy way to feed kids high nutri high highly packed nutritious foods because they're so sweetened by the banana, by the the date. You can put it in a date in there. You could also you know have the child do it. They love they love to make it. But the frozen berries, the frozen berries are key. I find personally, they'll drink anything if there's frozen berries in there. So test it out. Try different recipes, but get those smoothies. Um, to make sure that uh, you're getting all the nutrients possible into their system. Next one here, na neboja S SRB. Okay, any any suggestions for mixing weight training with MMA and boxing? Yeah, keep it to a minimum. You know, if if you do a lot of weight training, you take away a lot from boxing. I prefer doing calisthenics, body weight exercise, gymnastics. Now, I, I, this question came in, you know, almost I would say twice, but you guys liked it twice, and it's such a common question. If you mix too many too much weights with your martial arts training, it'll get in the way of your martial arts training. Keep the weights to a minimum and use body weight. And here's another tip for you. Body weight training doesn't affect the nervous system as much. If I do body weight squats as opposed to back squat, I'll f have far more chance of getting sore with the back squat, the barbell on my back. Okay? It's going to take it's going to tax my nervous system more. Now, if you look at Christopher Summer, Christopher Summer wrote a great book called The Olympic Body talks about how to build your body with gymnastics check out christopher summer an amazing material and he has some leg exercises variations of the pistol the squat etc etc that will tax your that are very difficult they'll create an incredible amount of strength in your legs but won't tax your nervous system okay so he's using leverage against the muscle instead of an external weight okay so that's my recommendation to you this one's a small one here let me zoom in here a little bit <clears throat> Uh, this one's from Has Ladine. Do you have any any of your fighters lift weights? And if not, what do you get someone to do when they're trying to build functional strength for MMA? Gymnastics and force, like I said, but also the stability ball. I love the stability ball. I think you should, you should, um, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, Jeff Glover. He does a lot of stuff on there. There's a lot of jiu -jitsu guys who, who use it. Um, also, um, uh, Cobrinha uses it as well. He does a lot of crazy stuff on it. I do it as well. I think it's great. Stability ball is huge. Try standing on a stability ball for 10 minutes. That's one of my workouts. I get on the stability ball. I want to keep my knees really safe. And in, in this book, New Power Program, um, Michael Kogan, he's 65 years old in this book, and he stands on a stability ball. He's 65 years old. The man is 65 years old. He's in great shape. He was talking about how important, how important it is to have stable knees. It's a phenomenal book, by the way, New Power Program. And stable knees his knees are so stable he can stand on a uh exercise ball now I, i'll jump up on an exercise ball somebody rolls it to me i'll jump up on it it takes a lot of stability and one of my workouts is just to stand on it for 10 minutes not an easy thing give it a try make sure you have uh somebody spot you i don't want you guys to roll off the ball and hurt yourselves okay it could be a little bit dangerous if you don't have the experience with the exercise ball, don't try to stand on it. Forget my recommendation on that. It's a bad idea. But if those of you who are really experienced and you're able to stand on the ball, try standing on it for 10 minutes. It's a killer workout. 
it will it will uh, really stimulate the stabilizers in your feet and your uh, your legs. Incredible stuff there. Next one here, Marius Aglin. What type of food do you think is best in the early day, midday or evening? Now this is a very very it's a very good question. Now you want to have your biggest meals during the day. Okay, so in the morning you want to have your biggest meals. Morning and lunch should be your bigger meals. Now, in between that, you should be snacking. Okay, you should. The, the ultimate is if you can get, you know, a few hundred calories in your system every few hours. So five hundred calories every few hours. Every three hours, four hours, get five, five or six hundred calories in your system. Plant foods, high in fiber, quinoa, vegetables, um, fruits, uh, dates, <clears throat> anything comes from plants. Lentils, beans, etc. And that's the ultimate. But if you're if you're if you're only gonna eat three meals, let's say you're a really busy person and you're only eating three meals in the day, your your bigger meals should be in the morning, in the day, in the daytime. Sorry, so morning and lunch. Your last meal should be the the smallest meal. Now, for me, when I feel I need to lose a little bit of weight or I need to trim down a little bit, my last meal will just be uh, fruits. Okay, so I obviously I train. That's why I'm having fruits. I train at night. I come home. I'm gonna have a little bit of carbs. So after training, you should have some carbs. So if I wasn't training, if, I, if you're sedentary, come home and have a salad. That's your last meal of the day. It should be just a salad. You know, make it really good. You know, don't don't be scared. Add some nice ingredients in there. Make it a nice salad, but it should just be salad. Now, if you're training, after training, you have to have carbs. People think you need proteins after training. It's a myth. You don't need animal pr proteins, etc. And now you need some proteins. Yeah, like if you if you're if you're eating some proteins, that's fine. No, we definitely need the macronutrients. Okay, we definitely need carbs, proteins, and fats. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about the different ratios, but I, I, my last meal has to be really light, high in nutrition and low in calories. So what I do is I usually cut up a few oranges. I'll have three, four oranges. I'll have, a, a, you know, whatever fruits lying around. I have tons of fruit in the house. I chop it up, apples, whatever, and I just, just eat fruit. And I will get trim immediately from that. I do that for two, three days. I start to lose immediately. I start to lose weight. So you're, if you make your last meal really, really light, it's super crucial because you're going to go to bed soon. And when you go to bed, your metabolism slows down. And whatever your body doesn't use for energy, what does it do? Remember, it stores it as fat. So if you give your body food in the morning and then lunch, you're using it. You know, you're going to go train after work. You're busy. You're, you you need it for, for your job, etc. You're busy. You know, during the day, your, your, your metabolism is kicking in. At night, it's shutting down. So why give it extra food? Keep your last meal really, really light. That's my advice to you. Hope it helps. <clears throat> Next one here, Troy Yang. I'm a 22-year-old BJJ guy. I try to go to the gym two to three times a week. I uh, get proper rest and nutrition. Do you think that two days of conditioning sessions are plenty? And if so, do you think it's better if one of them is strength and one of them is cardio? So what you're asking me here is, I go to the gym three time, three to four times a week. Should I do one day cardio, one day strength, two days of conditioning? I would say no. I think that's a really bad idea. Now, I'll tell you why. Now, let's say me and you, were, we were, we're two white belts. Okay, I'll make this really, really simple. We're two white belts, and we're both training five days a week. We're training five days a week, but you do one day of strength and conditioning. Now, you said two days. I'll give you just one day. Just one day. Imagine you only took one day of strength and conditioning. I'm taking no days of strength and conditioning. I'm just doing jujitsu. Now, at the end of the year, let's say we didn't. Let's say we took two weeks off for for the holidays, or whatever. We trained fifty. 50 weeks. Now, when you went to strength and conditioning, I went to jujitsu. Now, my practice, let's say, when I trained jujitsu, is about two hours long, minimum. Let's say it was one hour long. So after one year, I've done 50 hours more jujitsu than you because you were doing strength and conditioning. I was doing jujitsu. I did it every single day. Now, after one year, 50 more hours of jujitsu, which would probably be more like 100 hours, but let's give you all the benefit. And remember, you said two times a week, so it would be more like, 200 hours, okay? Um, after a few years, I'm going to have so many more hours of jiu-jitsu than you. I'm just going to be, I'm going to kick your ass. You just won't be able to compete with me. You're going to be doing weights and I'm going to be doing so much more jiu-jitsu and my understanding of jiu-jitsu is going to be so much greater than yours that when we roll, that extra weightlifting you did or whatever, it's not going to help. Now, I'll tell you something. I believe in doing strength and conditioning. I do it after my jiu-jitsu practice. I do it after boxing. Like the traditional martial artist always did. When did Ali do his fitness? He did it before, a little bit he ran, then he would do his pads, then he would do sit-ups and push-ups after practice. He didn't cancel a day of training. 
you know, uh, the, the Setiev, the, you know, the one of the, arguably the greatest wrestler of all time, didn't take a day off, two days off during the week to go lift weights. He, he did not. He would, he, would, he would wrestle and then he'll do his conditioning. After practice, so you, you finish BJJ, you finish Muay Thai, you finish Jiu Jitsu, you go to the bar, you go to the, the pull up bar, you do your pull ups, you do your kettlebell stuff, you do your kettlebell squats, you do your push ups, you do your gymnastic stuff. You just hang out an extra half hour building your body. Now, if I do that three, four days a week, I didn't miss any jujitsu because I'm doing my strength and conditioning after jujitsu. So what I'm saying to you is put in a little bit of extra time after practice, after your sport practice, your BJJ. Don't waste don't waste two days a week lifting weights and running on a treadmill. You know, with the exception of running. I, I think running is important for MMA. I think running is super key, but I think you shouldn't you should run after practice. I'm a big believer in doing things after practice. You look at the Muay Thai guys. Look up, find me, go on, go on YouTube, and find me a video of a Muay Thai guy getting tired in a fight. Just show me, show me, please show me that. Like, like, like you know, I've seen Muay Thai MMA guys that get tired in a fight. Can you please show me a Muay Thai guy who fights and is huffing and puffing and just can't take anymore? And he's, he's a he's a Muay Thai guy. He comes from Thailand. Now Thailand, their their game is very simple. They run, and then they they do their sport. Sometimes they run before, and sometimes they run after. And I've trained with the Thais in Thailand for months at a time. Running and the sport. Running and the sport. And they do a little bit of weights. They do some calisthenics, too. But they don't have a strength and conditioning coach. Um, they don't, you know, Muhammad Ali didn't have some guy who you go see twice a week to make him lift weights. That, that's just crazy. It's just, I don't know, preposterous, you know. Look at Mayweather. When does he do his strength and conditioning? He runs, does his boxing workout, then he does his... He does his calisthenics after practice. So I think we should need, to, we, MMA needs to go back to that traditional style of, of, of fitness and uh, and stay away from the this craziness of, uh, of giving up days of skill work to go lift weights. I think that's, I think it's a little nuts. Uh, Jonathan Sue, hey Faraz, love your videos. When I became a fan of MMA nearly a decade ago, I found that it was more. I was more of a fan of camps than fighters themselves. TriStar was easily my favorite as there was clearly an intellectual approach from all the way uh, from all the fighters which obviously came top down anyways my question is is this in this strategically evolving sport did you hold any misconceptions on training fighting that you changed recently in the five in the last five ten years um did i have any do I have any misconceptions in the five ten, last five ten years absolutely absolutely you know i've changed my i'm always adapting my formula of training i'm always learning new ways to do things and i would say you know one thing that really really uh um, I've really uh, started doing lately in the last, I would say, year and a half is using the stability ball. You know, that 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 ball, every gym has it, but I've been doing a lot of crazy g gymnastic stuff on it and I've, I really found that it gave me another level of strength. Now, I know it sounds crazy, but, you know, one thing I saw Cobrinha doing it and, you know, he won Abu Dhabi's twice and I was like, dude, he must be so strong. I've never rolled with Cobrinha, but I'm, I, I seen him doing these crazy things on the, on the stability ball. And when I do the stability ball and I roll after and I grab a guy's wrist or I grab his neck and I'm like, man, I'm so much stronger. How come I like I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly a super strong guy. Like, I don't roll with people and people tell me, hey, you're so freakishly strong. I don't get that a lot. But when I do stability ball, I, I'm not I never feel I never go on the mat and feel like oh, I power, overpower the guy. It's not my style. But when I do stability ball, I, I start to get that glimpse of it. Like, wow, I felt really strong. I moved really well. I rolled really well. I jumped really well. And. That stability ball, you know, and sometimes I would go to gymnastics after doing stability ball, and we'll go do a gymnastic workout, and my flips were better, my and my mus my muscle ups were getting, my ring workout was better, all from adding stability ball. So one thing that years ago I wouldn't do any of stability ball to me was just like for rehab, and now it's kind of I've considered it more of a, as a power tool. But again, I don't use those Mickey Mouse exercises you would find on on Google. Like if you go Google now stability ball exercises. You're gonna see a lot of mom and dad, uh, you know, lie down on the weight and move your arm. No, no, that's just that's just too elementary. That's just too basic. The stuff I do on the stability ball is crazy. You know, it's it's, it's gymnastics. So uh, maybe one day I'll do a video on that. I do a lot of rolling off it, jumping off it on the knees, standing up on it, one knee on it. So kneeling on it to standing up. Uh, we we stand up on. So two guys will stand up on it, and I'll throw a medicine ball, and we throw a medicine ball to each other. We do all sorts of crazy extreme stability ball stuff. And um, if you guys check out. Jeff Glover, he's got some crazy videos online and uh, on YouTube, and that's the that's the way to go. So that's that's one of my misconceptions. I used to think it was only for rehab, but uh, now I found out that it's it's really a powerful tool. 
Uh, I think we're running a long time here, guys. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna button it up real soon here. Hassan Al Kayat, I am always impressed by high level jujitsu guys and how flexible they are. My question is, do you do yoga and any mobility drills? Thank you. I'm not a believer in yoga, so I I do some yoga once in a while. I think I do it once. I the last time I did yoga was like a year and a half ago for fun, just for fun, you know. And uh, it's not a main it's not a main component of my training. Now mobility work definitely. Mobility work is huge. If you don't have proper mobility, so if, if my arm, you know, if my arm doesn't move this way very well, if I if I do this and it feels really stiff, and then I'm grappling and all of a sudden I move it really quick. Something's gonna something's gonna bust up, you know, something's gonna get pulled. You should be able to move your body freely. You should be able to roll, turn, twist, climb freely. There should be no stiffness in your body. Now I'll tell you one thing. My body is very, very low on stiffness. My I have I'm I'm not I wanna say I'm flexible, I'm very mobile. Now why? Because I work a lot of my mobility. Now in my opinion, the best book on this, the best, 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 best is How to Become a Supple Leopard by Kelly Starrett. Be excuse me, Becoming a Supple Leopard. It's a bit of a strange um, title, but this book, you must read this book if you want to keep your body healthy. This book is an eye-opening uh, uh, book. You know, and, and when George Torres ACL the second time, I, 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 I got in contact with Kelly Starrett. I, I made, made it a point to have Kelly work with uh, George St. Pierre, he's, the, he's a PhD in physiotherapy. He's a, he's the mastermind of keeping uh, people's bodies healthy. You could find his material online, buy his books. His books are incredible, incredible. Now, the book I recommend the most is Becoming a Supple Leopard by Kelly Starrett. Becoming a Supple Leopard. Now, in this book, he talks to you why, why mobility is superior to stretching. I couldn't agree more with him. You don't need to be super flexible. Now, I'll tell you something. When I spar with guys who do a lot of yoga, and this is just my personal ob observation. I don't have any uh, research on to back this up. I know a couple of guys who do a lot of jiu-jitsu and a lot of yoga. It seems to, people love it. Yoga, jiu-jitsu, mixed together. I find those guys are super, super weak. And I, and I hate to say that. I'm not trying to insult anybody. I respect all arts. When I roll with these yoga guys and I get a hold of them, I feel like I just, cr I just crushed them. I just grabbed them and I, I, I feel they're just really easy to manipulate. Now they're flexible and yeah they they you know they're hard to uh, no, I wouldn't say they're hard to the guards usually are good or whatnot but I just feel like I can I don't, that doesn't work on me you know I just feel like I really can can cut through all that so for me I prefer mobility over hyper flexibility now hyper flexibility is an asset in some some areas but in my opinion I just find that there's a strong muscular you know uh, gymnast it's they have flexibility great flexibility. But you need that strength. Yoga, in my opinion, doesn't build that type of strength that gymnast has. And I know yogis are going to be like, hey, no, we have plenty of strength. Go on the gymnastics ring. I'm talking about gymnastic strength. Go do what the gymnasts do. Go and go, in, go into a gymnastics club and then tell me if you're strong. Don't compare yourself to mom and dad and a couple of other BJJ guys. Talk to me about the best of the best, the strongest athletes, in my opinion. Functional strength is the gymnast. And compare yourself to him. There is nothing you can do that he can't do other than put your legs in, in a pretzel position behind your neck, which is, I'm not going to do in a fight anyway. So I don't do any yoga. Mobility is huge to keep your body healthy. I'm going to do episodes just on that. It's huge. If you want to train daily, you must maintain your mobility. If you lose your mobility, it's a matter of time before you get injured. All right, guys, this has been going on for 48 minutes. I'm going to give you guys a little more here. Um, Hydro King, thoughts on fasting for losing weight and training while fasting. Training, losing weight, Using fasting to lose weight, in my opinion, is not a good idea. Now, you can do some detoxes and stuff like that. I've never done it. I don't know much about it. I do fast once a year for Ramadan. Training during Ramadan, I really lower my training immensely to the point where I don't do any training. You know, I'll just go to the gym, give my classes, and that's it for the day. Um, during When Ramadan's in the winter months, I will train. So I'll eat and go train because the sun sets around 4 p.m. here in Montreal. In the summer times, it sets around 8. After 8, I cannot train. I just can't train. By the time I have anything in my system, my body's just too tired. So summer months, fasting is way harder than winter months here in Montreal. So depending on what season you're in, be very careful when you're fasting. If you're doing it for uh, um, religious purposes or whatnot, be very careful with training while fasting. It is, is, a, is, a, is a crazy combination. You give your body no food and then you're asking your body to train, to spend energy. Where is it going to get that energy? Well, yes, your body can, can start 
chewing up all the fat. It could start digesting your own muscle. It could start doing all sorts of stuff to get that energy. Not really healthy stuff, okay? We want to build the body. We, wanna we don't want to break down the body. Fasting is good for certain elements like detoxing, uh, spiritual reasons, etc. Um, controlling your desires, whatever. All, all sorts of great psychological issues. But in terms of performance, fasting is not a good idea. In terms of performance, you know, be careful with fasting. Don't try to perform while fasting. Don't try to go and do crazy rounds of jujitsu while fasting. You'll just end up fainting, uh, causing causing uh, <clears throat> organ damage, etc. Don't go there, okay? Fasting and sports don't mix, okay? Next one. Pre-time das. Is it possible for you to for your body to sustain itself by going on a no carb diet, or do you need carbs to survive? Now, there is no such thing as a as a carb deficiency. You can have a deficiency in fats. You can have a deficiency. In, in vitamins, etc. You can have all sorts of deficiencies. You cannot have a carb deficiency. Okay, so if you ate no carbs, you won't die. You, you won't get, you. your body's not going to become uh, malnourished. So no carb is okay in terms of staying nourished. But in terms of performance, I think it's not good. I don't think it's good. I prefer high carb, low fat. Now, if you mix carbs and fat, if you're a high carb, high fat guy, you're going to be extremely unhealthy. So you, you need to choose one. You got to either lower your fats and live off carbs, or you got to live off fats and chop down your carbs. When you mix carbs and fats, you spike your insulin. Okay, So your body produces... If you That's why ice cream is so good, right? It's lots of fat, lots of sugar. You mix it. Ooh, it feels good. Ice cream. Whenever you think about it, whenever you pack in sugar and fat, bang, you get this crazy feeling. Now your body's buzzing, but your body's creating a lot of insulin. Insulin drives fat into the cells. That's this it's fat it drives fat into the cells. It makes your heart fat. It makes everything in your system fat. It clogs you up. Fat is no good. You don't want visceral fat. Joel Furman talks about visceral fat, the fat you have inside your body. Make sure to read The End of Dieting. It's an ultimate uh, book on, on nutrition. It's written by a doctor, so it's written by an MD. So I couldn't recommend it any higher. He's high carb, low fat. I'm high carb, high carb, low fat. I've done them both. Try them both. And do your research on on low carb, low carb, high fat. It's really bad stuff, man. Really, really, really good way to get unhealthy. Okay, we don't want to be unhealthy. I prefer uh, the end of dieting. Joel Furman, check him out. Next one here. Um, next one here. Fin Finanzam Blush, man. These these are some horrible usernames, guys. You need some some normal usernames. How much weightlifting can MMA training get along with? Or would you recommend body weight exercise instead? Talked about it already. Thank you for your question. Great stuff. Body weight, a little bit of weightlifting. Marvin Rinovich threw away all the weightlifting. I think that's a little extreme. I think when you do a lot of training in MMA, so think about it. In training, you're doing boxing, you're doing jiu-jitsu, you're doing all this aerobic stuff, you know, and you lose muscle. The fastest way, sorry, I just kicked one of my daughter's toys. The fastest way, to build muscle is not necessarily body weight. So if I if I'm if I'm doing a lot of jiu-jitsu and I'm getting scrawny, I'm getting skinny, I need to pack on more muscle. I hit I hit the barbell. You know, but because the thing is doing long rounds of jiu-jitsu and kickboxing, it's very cardio. It's very cardio, high cardio, high cardio. And then when you do a lot of high cardio, you lose muscle. You lose muscle. You lose muscle. I need to jump that muscle back up real quick. I use the barbell. Barbell's the best. Better than body weight. So once in a while, if I feel like I'm losing too much weight, like recently I was weighing 167. I was waking up in the morning, weighing myself 167. I don't like I don't like to go under 170. So I started to hit the barbell. Why? If I do body weights, I'll probably keep dropping. I'll probably keep dropping. I'll probably keep dropping. Body weight, you'll lose more weight. So you need a compound lift. So that's why I believe that I don't like to throw away all, all tools. I like to know what every tool does. Plyometrics. What do plyometrics do? What do barbell lifts do? What do kettlebell? What does kettlebell do? What does body weight do? What does stretch bands do? And if a, st a client comes to me and he has a particular need, I use the best tool for that purpose. Okay, so barbells are good for packing on muscle. I was losing too much weight, I started hitting the barbell. Okay, so and and sometimes it's good. You know, you want to add, you want to increase your pec size, you want to increase your shoulder size. The best way, if you want to add size in a particular area, the barbell. It's huge. Okay, next one. <clears throat> Thai onion. <laughs> funny, funny username. Taiwan on. He just kind of jumbled the letters in a weird way. Training and overtraining. Different people have different methods. So using GSP and say either Diaz brothers as an example, do they take breaks during the week or is it a 24-7 training routine? Thanks. 
um, you run a great channel. Thank you. So your question here, it's kind of weirdly uh, put, but training and overtraining, training versus overtraining. Do we take rest or do we just train 24 hours a day? Now, in exercise science, we have a principle, very simple, okay? So it's, it's stress plus recovery equals adaptation. Very simple formula. Stress plus recovery equals adaptation. If you put stress plus stress plus stress equals what? Overtraining, injury, etc. Fatigue, <clears throat> all sorts of bad things. You need some recovery. You need some recovery. So a lot of people take this information as black and white. Okay, so I'm going to train Monday. I'm going to rest on, Wednesday, on, on Tuesday. And I'm going to train Wednesday. So I'm going to mix in recovery and stress. I think it's a very elementary way of looking at it. It's a very unsophisticated way to train. Now, the way I do it is I train every day. I rest on Sunday. I rest one day a week. But I don't train so much that my body cannot recover. I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to sleep eight hours. I, I get a solid eight hours every day. In the middle of the day, I like to really sit quietly. No music, no noise. Just I like to sit quiet. I kind of like. I don't necessarily nap, but I, I rest. I just kind of close my eyes and I just go in the parasympathetic state. I just calm. I rest my body. I feel re-energized after. Whether I fall asleep or not, it doesn't matter. I try to sleep. If I don't sleep, it's not a problem. I get really quiet in the dark, rest. Because between my day, between the two big practices, I get plenty of rest. But I never, I never need to take a day off because I never fatigue myself so much that I can't rest in that window. So now it's I just finished training. It's really late at night. I, I ate, I'm going to go rest. Once I go to bed, that's my rest. So I did stress in the day, recovery at night, adaptation in the morning. A lot of people train so hard on Monday that they're so burnt on Tuesday. They went so far that they need that day to recover. I think that's just a crazy way to, to try to excel. Your recovery is your sleep and your rest. So you're training six days a week. Some people train seven. I think it's a little crazy. You know, I like to have a bit of a life, you know, family day and stuff like that. Um, mix in your rest. Your rest is your night time. Don't train so hard that the rest at night is not enough. That's a good rule of thumb for you. Okay, guys, we are 57 minutes in. I was supposed to do 45 minutes, but I'm going to pack on a few more just because I like you guys. Andrew Persh, how much are you involved in your athlete's nutrition and fitness routine? Do you design strength and conditioning programs and nutrition programs for them, or do you have a team that delegate? you delegate that to? And should an MMA coach monitor those programs or should they have separate individual teams to handle nutrition and strength conditioning? Well, what you're asking me here, real simple, is do I do my, my trainers, my fighters' uh, strength and conditioning program? Some of them, yes. Some of them, yes. They put that in my hands. Now, I consider myself an expert in strength and conditioning. And I believe in martial arts conditioning. And I think that the problem is when you delegate it to someone, they're using their crazy philosophy. And they know nothing about martial arts. And they think getting strong on weights translates to the mat, where they have no no evidence for that whatsoever. And Marvin Rinovich has contended contested the opposite. He says that it's the opposite. Now, I brought a lot of great books out here today that I want to kind of uh, refer to and mention, but I didn't get to them. Okay, but these are a lot of great classical manuals. Great, great, great manuals. Okay, we have super training as well. Can't forget super training, but. After reading all these texts, and I read these years ago, and I've corresponded with a lot of the the, the authors of this bo these books. You know, I've got to train and work with a lot of great great um, coaches over the years, and I, I only say that just because I want to give them credit. You know, I didn't come up with this stuff myself. This is all stuff that their research, uh, uh, you know, made made possible for us to know. You know. Them sharing their research with us, them publishing these great books, and I want to give credit where credit is due. These are brilliant men. They wrote a lot of great material. But the thing is, what's happening on the mats, what's happening in the ring, what's happening in the octagon is far beyond what they know. Okay, They only know how to build you on the barbell. But the thing is, if you study these books, and these are thick books, to get a little bit stronger on the barbell or a lot stronger, does it really matter? Now, I'll tell you something. I use a lot of their principles for the mat. That's where it got crazy for me, where I really started excelling as a trainer. I use all their principles but on the mat. So I don't use a particular exact codes of, of so like for instance, for, this is a brilliant book. If you want, if you want to, this book was written, I, don't, I can't remember what year it was. 
It must be over 10 years. This book is amazing. This book is unbelievable. The, the New Power Program. He basically takes these two books here. Okay, now if you're, if you're a lifting coach, you know these two books. Super Training and Tudor Pompas Periodization. You know these two books. You must know them. If you don't know these two books, you're not an expert trainer. Okay, these are the classic manuals. Michael Kogan took those two books and made it super simple and super easy to understand. He made it Mickey Mouse. He gave you a bunch of pictures. He didn't get overly technical. Okay, he made it really, really simple. And that's why I like it. Simple is good. Now, I've gone through the other two manuals. The only thing in Michael Kogan's book that I don't like, this one here, is that he recommends one rep maxes, really high, heavy weights. You don't need it. Now, the reason why he does it is because he's training you to be a lifter. Now, if you want to be a lifter, do it his way. I don't want to be a lifter. I'm a jiu-jitsu guy. So I wouldn't recommend that for jiu-jitsu guys. Do never, never jiu-jitsu guys, boxers, Muay Thai guys, you should never lift your one rep max. Now, the other thing that's missing is the conjugate method. Okay, so uh, in super training, you have something called the conjugate method, which I highly, highly recommend above periodization. So periodization, for those of you who don't know, they say first you got to build your connective tissue, then you got to build your stabilizer string, then you got to build the core lifts, then the plyometrics, the link cycle. So you, they're taking you through all these phases and he says the shortest program is six months. That's what they say. <clears throat> no program is shorter than six months. Now, now in super training, they talk about the conjugate method. They talk about, so prioritization, you would, you would build strength, then you would build endurance. Okay, so you build, you build strength, explosiveness, and endurance. Okay, depending on your sport, etc. You'd go through a different prioritization. You don't have time for that in MMA. In my opinion, in MMA, you're always building strength, you're always building endurance, and you're always building explosiveness. Now, that's called the conjugate method. Uh, in super training, they describe the conjugate method. That's, that's the most unique aspect of Yuri. Okay, the author of this book, incredible. I won't try to say his last name. It's too difficult. It's a huge Russian, long, long Russian name. He talks about the conjugate method. I think it's the most powerful thing, powerful thing he's contributed to. Uh, Louis Simmons, if you guys know Louis Simmons, uh, from uh, West Side Barbell, he's probably the best strength coach in the world, a powerlifting coach, powerlifting coach, okay, so he's got the strongest gym in the world, he's literally, he's got the strongest gym in the world, he's got the best lifters in the world, and they use the conjugate method, okay, that's when you're building endurance, power, uh, and uh, stability, all at once, okay, so you kind of be juggling all the components, now, I'm not going to get into the conjugate method too deeply here, but basically, that's what I use. I don't believe in periodization because I never know when you're booking a fight. I never know when your next grappling tournament is. Could you imagine lifting weights for six months to have a grappling? And that would just be crazy. That would just be crazy. Tournaments are happening all the time. For martial artists, we need the conjugate method. Okay, so. Okay, guys, I think I've gone a little bit. Oh, I've gone way over time. So let me go. One last question. Here we go. It's from No You May Not. How do you feel about vegan diets in general for athletic performance? Now, the vegan diet is it's it's really good and, and and it can be really bad you know because some things that are vegan that are considered vegan vegan is nothing from no animal products at all not only do you not eat animals but you won't drink milk you won't cheese nothing that comes from an animal okay you won't eat the uh, caviar nothing that comes from an animal whatsoever you will not touch it now being vegan there's a lot of in in that category of foods there's a lot of healthy foods but there's a lot of foods processed foods that are not healthy so if you're a vegan and you balance your food perfectly and you know how much, if you go towards the, the, the whole foods and the ve list of vegan foods, you'll be extremely healthy. You'll be super healthy. You have a very low stress diet. You'll have high energy. You'll feel fine. But if you start eating you know, crazy amounts of, of processed vegan foods, you know, flours and whatever, whatnot, you can be fat. You can be highly unhealthy. So Vegan is a very general term. Do you know how to balance a vegan diet? Do you know how to stay away from the list of foods that, that exist in a vegan diet that are not necessarily the best? Okay, cooked foods, etc., uh, processed foods. So, <clears throat> very important to to know which foods are the best. Now, again, if you read the end of dieting, you would know that um, the most of his foods would would pass the vegan, you know, uh, the vegan test. Now, at the top of his pyramid, he has non-vegan foods, flesh foods, cheese, etc. He allows you a little bit of processed foods. He allows you a little bit of non-vegan foods, okay? But it's, in the book, End of Dieting, he teaches you how to balance your diet. So, for for instance, people tell me, hey, I'm paleo. What does that mean? What does that mean? Doesn't this, you might be super healthy on paleo. You might be super unhealthy. Are you eating a lot of greens and vegetables or are you eating a lot of red meat? You're both paleo. If one guy eats red meat once a week, but eats fruits and vegetables and seeds the whole other, the rest of the time, another guy who eats bacon every single morning, 
he's also paleo. They're both paleo. But one of them is having a lot of animal fats and the other one is not. One is super healthy one is not. So being paleo, just saying you're paleo, you have to be specific. How do you balance your paleo diet? How do you balance your vegan diet? That's why it's not only what's the list of foods I'm allowed to eat, but what is the list of food? Uh, what, what is the balance? What is the ratio I'm eating? So that's why the pyramid is so important. It's not just a list of foods. Okay, so we need to have a good list of foods and then we need to know how to balance it. Now, I'll leave you guys with this because I'm way over the time. It's going to be long before I can... Uh, it's gonna probably take hours to upload to YouTube. So I'm gonna do one last thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you guys with an anecdote that that uh, Dr. Joel Furman mentions in his book End of Dieting <clears throat> that I've already recommended maybe 20 times. He says, Look, when people tell me they're hungry, he says, Okay, you're hungry. He says, Here, eat this bucket of broccoli. And you're like, No, I don't want this bucket of broccoli. I'm not hungry for that. Joel says, Dr. Furman says, You have a toxic hunger. Okay, so basically you're not hungry for nu nutrients, you're hungry. For whatever, whatever, um, whatever habit you formed, whatever toxic desire you have, whatever, um, how do you say that again? I'm looking a little tired here. Um, addiction, that's the word, addiction. So you're addicted to sugar, you're addicted to fats. You want that kick, you want that, that substance that you're addicted to. That's what you're looking for. You're not really hungry. Hungry is to, to satiate the body's need for nutrition. That's what true hunger is. So here you are, here's the nutrition. You don't want it, you're not really hungry. That's toxic hunger. You learn to have this type of hunger. This is something you conditioned your body to want, like if you were a smoker. Now, I don't crave smoking. I wake up in the morning, and I don't, I don't want a cigarette. If somebody offered me a cigarette, I'd say, no, thank you. But if I started smoking two, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, now I'd wake up in the morning, I'd be like, hey, I need another hit of nicotine. My body would call for it, okay? So that would be toxic. That would be a toxic, toxic addic addiction. You do the same thing to your body with foods. So if you don't want to eat that broccoli, you don't want that healthy salad, it's not for you. That means you're not really in need of nutrition. You may you just have a toxic desire for food. You have a toxic desire to satisfy that drug, that need for that drug. Because don't forget, food is a drug. Sugar is a drug. Caffeine is a drug. It needs to be stay in check. Keep those to a minimum. Condition your body to eat healthy foods. Read the book, End of Dieting. It's a phenomenal book. And on that note, I will end this episode. Thank you very much. For those of you who listened to the whole thing, I wish you good health. Lean, uh, trim physique uh, all year round, all the time, not just for summer. Keep your body trim and healthy. And uh, if you guys like and share this often, I will, um, I will definitely make more of these fascinating stuff. I didn't get to do 5% of the questions. Okay, you guys send me so much great stuff. Lots of interesting topics. And some of these topics I could have done a whole video on, so I might do that again in the future. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and I will see you in the next episode. Thank you.